I love sessions like this because I get to skip over basically my first couple slides because you guys are undoubtedly a group who have a good comprehension of the biome and the microbiome in general. And it's awesome for me because then I don't have to worry about explaining to a bunch of people who still think urine is sterile um, that, uh, <laughs> that there is much uh, information to be had within the urinary tract. I'm just going to start off with some of my funding and disclosures. And then, you know, I, uh, just a brief overview just to make sure we're all on the same page. We all know human microbiome exists um, in the body. And we think that these polymicrobial communities seem to have a role in supporting the normal activity of, of the organs and, and sort of all physiologic functions throughout, throughout the body. And so uh, it's worth studying. And when we talk about the urine, urine was has been thought to be sterile previously. And if you ask, you know, nine out of 10 urologists, they probably still think it is sterile. Um, and so there's definitely this difficulty kind of getting out that message to the larger community of physicians. But we all, I hope, uh, accept now that urine is not in fact sterile and that these more sensitive techniques of being able to look at the urine based, you know, not just in, in uh, molecular diagnostics, but even more sensitive culture-based techniques can identify a multitude of microbes, even in asymptomatic, relatively healthy individuals. And while we assume <laughs> that the microbiome in the urinary tract is symbiotic with, health, with, with individuals, meaning it's supposed to you know, kind of support the the normal bladder function. There really isn't a lot of direct primary evidence to support that as a concept. It's so it's kind of something that we tend to assume and have yet to really kind of identify those mechanisms by which it actually is supporting that normal function. And so when we think about what the activities of the microbiome might be, um, we're learning a lot of this stuff from from other systems like the the gut or you know uh, the gut's probably the biggest place in which we've learned a lot of this stuff and that's where a lot of this is coming from with the thought process that microbes in the urinary tract when they are performing that symbiotic that normal commensal function that they are supporting um the maintenance of the epithelium as a as a sort of non-permeable structure they're producing antimicrobial compounds that prevent infections they are supporting a normal immune system and even supporting normal neuronal function and also kind of filling a space that otherwise would be filled by uh, pathogenic bacteria. Um, so that's cool. So this is kind of this model that that at least I, I, I think is is not necessarily taken as as dogma now, but but is is one potential model for what the microbiome might do. And then when the microbiome gets out of sync and we see a dysbiotic microbiota in, in the urinary tract, that there are things that those organisms no longer do that lead to organ dysfunction. And so taking a lot of what's been learned in other organ systems, we can hypothesize that a microbiota that is out of sync with us, if you will, um, leads to abnormal bladder function and thus to lower urinary tract symptomatology and infections and other kinds of things. And so those things that might happen, which again, this is all kind of hypothetical, is that you get that breakdown of an epithelial barrier, you get um, immune dysregulation, neuronal dysregulation, increased vascularity, and all in all, when that it proceeds unchecked or is perpetuated, you get muscular neuronal dysfunction causing bladder dysfunction and lower urinary tract symptoms. So that's kind of, I'm also a clinician. And so my, the vast majority of my clinical practice, I do very little prolapse these days, much to my chagrin, but um, most of it deals with voiding dysfunction and a lot of these more uncomfortable urinary tract symptoms. Now we used to always call these, uh, or are not used to, but there's been a, a trend in urology, at least, to, to note these as storage lower urinary tract symptoms. I really like the older term, which was irritative urinary tract symptoms, because I think it does a better job of encompassing not just incontinence and difficulty holding urine, but also some of those things, you know, we have a lot of patients who don't have any trouble holding it, but their bladder is just not happy all the time. And they're, they're just running around constantly aware of it and uncomfortable. And I think it's better captured in that term. So I'm quietly still using the old, old out of date term in a lot of my, my, my talks. So, so thinking about these irritative symptoms, 
you know, we're talking about urinary frequency, urgency, discomfort, pain, pressure, getting up at night to go to the bathroom, pain with urination, um, all that kind of stuff, it, up to including in, incontinence. But in general, these two, uh, they, all of these symptoms end up getting classified into one of two syndromes, one of which is overactive bladder, which tends to have urgency or incontinence mostly as the key feature, and the other is being the more painful side of things. And again, when we talk about pain, we tend to encompass pain, pressure, discomfort, you know, hyper awareness of your bladder into that category. And that category gets gets classified as interstitial cystitis, which if people don't aren't familiar with that term is really a misnomer. So I just want to put that out there. There's no active for, for the vast majority of patients with bladder pain, there are no signs of active inflammation or tissue damage. And so it is not really, it is not either an interstitial disease, nor is it cystitis. And so it's entirely a misnomer. A lot of work trying to be done on trying to classify these patients better and to give them a better name that meets with a lot of resistance. But so the term is still there, but just want to want to focus on the idea that it's more these uncomfortable symptoms. And so the, the basic idea behind a lot of what I do is can, can we use the microbiome to better diagnose bladder pain, better to, to isolate out patients that uh, fit this category or that, or somehow guide their treatment. Uh, maybe if this actually does have some role in that process, if that model of a dysbiotic microbiota is correct, can it teach us about disease pathophysiology? And most, most importantly, from a clinical standpoint, what clinicians always want to know is, can it tell me what to do with these patients when they come in to see me? And so that's where a lot of this is focused. And when I sort of started in the field, there were a couple different studies that had been done. And since then, there have been way more. I'm sort of giving this as a weird historical perspective. Uh, on my brief career. Uh, but when I started sort of, this was the first paper that had come out and they looked at the microbiome in patients with IC versus patients who were healthy and found that there's just this sort of enrichment in, in lactobacilli in this in this group. And that was, you know, but what you can kind of notice is there's not a really big difference in the overall composition, just in the relative abundances when, when you look by next generation sequencing. And there have been a multitude of other papers that have come out. And here's an, another one looking at IC patients versus control patients. Um, I think I saw Dr. Wolf in the audience somewhere. Uh, so this is this is uh, from uh, the, uh, a collaborative group. Uh, but looking at those patients, you, you don't really see a lot of distinction between them. And I have to say, you know, we at least at first did not see anything any different than this. And so I was hoping that maybe we could find something different, but it was a little distressing to be starting off in a world where you're like, there's not really looking like a lot that you can follow, but we're going to keep trying. So um, our initial pilot study basically showed pretty much exactly the same thing, where you don't see a huge difference in composition between your healthy controls. This is all catheterized specimens done by next generation sequencing. And your controls, there's a little bit of lactobacillus, and then in your IC patients, there's a lot more lactobacillus, and but otherwise, there's not a huge difference in anything, which was a little depressing when you first start out um, and you're trying to start your own lab and this is all you get. But then it sort of brought us back to the stuff that I started talking about, which is how we diagnose and categorize these patients. And so I'm actually going to take a little bit of a, of a little digression into non-microbiome stuff. <laughs> so I apologize for that, but here it goes. Um, so the, the problem that we face you know, was we, we could either give up or try to figure out a different way to approach the data. And so at this point, we step, stepped back and tried to reconsider some of the assumptions that come into a lot of these studies when we study patients with IC. And the first thing you have to acknowledge if you're a clinician dealing with these patients is that there is a huge amount of overlap between patients with overactive bladder and IC. And even within the patients that we do end up diagnosing with IC, there's a huge amount of heterogeneity that makes that diagnosis both incredibly subjective and incredibly heterogeneous. And since we don't have any biomarkers or diagnostic testing, we decided that maybe there was a different way to approach the same kind of data and maybe get a better, better outcome. And so we decided that diagnosis was too dependent on the semantics and we would focus instead on the, on the actual symptoms that were described by the patients. And so what we did, eh, go for it. Okay, so while we could not, while all these diagnoses were really arbitrary, we decided that we would use validated symptomatic patient reported questionnaires as our model for how we would analyze this data moving forward. And so this got a little bit into, it, so it ended up with a total digression into another entire field of research. But the point is that basically we took this patient population 
and ended up using machine learning and specifically unsupervised clustering analysis to try to identify if there were unique phenotypes within the bladder pain population that might guide our microbiome analysis a lot better. And so I had a, a trainee, uh, Dr. Amaswiga, who did, who took a bunch of patients with, with the perception of bladder pain, gave them a whole bunch of questionnaires, and we did some unsupervised clustering. And what we actually found is that there were clusters, they separated out pretty nicely, and they had different sets of symptoms. And so when we looked, when we tried to sort of go the opposite direction and say, okay, if that's our, our phenotypes, what symptoms are the most important and that are driving the, the, the classification into different groups, we found that there were a couple of key features, and I won't spend too much time on this, but a couple of key features, you know, that were really isolatedly high, that's not English, but you know what I mean, that were specifically associated with each of the different phenotypes. And that allowed us to kind of come up with three different phenotypes within that perceived bladder pain cluster, a group of patients then that were fundamentally kind of different in how they behaved. And so we found that there was a group that really had bladder specific pain. And their big thing was that they described that their bladders hurt when they were full, they were better when they were empty, and it was very much related to the voiding cycle. There was a second group that really had, um, uh, these guys are hard. They have like urethral, vaginal, just pelvic pain. And they, they, and we'll see how they do with treatment, which is basically bad. Um, but they don't really have a relationship of their symptoms to voiding at all. And so we call this non-urologic pelvic pain. They have terrible pain. It's really awful. They think it's their bladder, but it has no relation to voiding. And then there was this other group that we called myofascial pain. And there's a long story behind how we decided they were myofascial pain. But their key features were frequency pressure. They often did not describe it as pain, but as pressure and discomfort. And this sensation of they can't empty their bladders. So it's like a hyper awareness of their bladder. And then this very uncomfortable desire to, to urinate, but often when they go, there's nothing there. And so that group, we have a whole other set of talks I could give if you ever want to hear about that group. But anyway, a lot of stories short, we basically found that they have EMG anomalies in their pelvic floor muscles and um, tenderness in their pelvic floor muscles on exam. So we called them our myofascial groups. So these are our new clusters of pain within the greater bladder pain phenotypes. Now, what's cool about that is that we then tried to look at how do these patients do clinically and there are totally different responses to treatment. So a lot of these patients all end up getting sort of the whole kitchen sink. And for those patients who did respond to something, we, we put them into the different categories and we found that that myofascial group responded to physical therapy, the bladder specific pain group responded to bladder directed therapies like intravesical installation. So when we put numbing medicine in their bladder, they feel better. When we give them medicines by mouth that have an analgesic in them that numbs the bladder, they do better. They don't do as well with things like centrally acting medications like amitriptyline. So, and then that, and then as I mentioned, that non-neurologic group doesn't do well at all with anything. So they're, I don't know what they, I, I don't know how to treat them, but I think that's why people get, I think that group is why people get so frustrated with these patients clinically, because we don't know how to take care of them and they're very refractory to treatment. So coming back to this concept, we're not going to call it interstitial cystitis anymore. We're going to talk about bladder pain specifically, and we're going to look at urinary microbial communities. So I came back to my data and I said, okay, now we got our phenotypes. Let's look at bladder pain and try to classify our microbial data. Can we do better this time? And if you could look, if you could see, this is sort of the stacked bar plot for a lot of those, that, that same group of patients, um, but now they're sort of ranked in terms of pain. And guess what? There's nothing there still. It's, that's very frustrating. Okay, so once again, come back to those fundamental assumptions and and question question our assumptions. And the next thing that you think about is the fact that age actually has a huge influence on the urinary microbiome. Our patient population was not restricted to premenopausal women. And what you end up finding is that the 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 variety really comes from age. And so if we now just decide that we're only going to, so basically that IC population, I think is highly enriched in lactobacillus, basically just because they're younger and we're trying to compare them to a much broader population that is, that is also includes some postmenopausal people. So fundamental flaw in how you're doing the analysis. So come back, do the analysis again. Now we're going to only take premenopausal people and now we get this. And so now we see a pattern. Now we see that there's something that seems to be associated with bladder pain specifically. And so now that we kind of had some ideas and, and about what we were doing wrong, 
We came back to, we now acquired another population of patients with perceived bladder pain and categorized them uh, by these phenotype systems and, but only included premenopausal people because we decided that the age variation associated with menopause was too great to overcome with just computational methods. So we just stuck with our premenopausal patients and these, I've forgotten to put in uh, one little bar here, which is my fault, but these are all pain patients. And basically you see kind of three different groups. Um, one of which there's a lot of lactobacillus everywhere. That's the orange. But what you see is there's a subset with the blue and that blue is E. coli. There's a subset with the purple and that's lactobacillus inners. And there's a subset with none of that that just look like, and if you compare that group in the middle with controls, they look just like controls. And so we've got nearly 50 patients here, all of which have pain. And what we found was that these patients categorized by those different patterns really correlated well with our types of pain that we see. So the myofascial pain group um, is, oh, let me do it this way. So uh, the, oops. So the ones that had specifically elevated levels of lactobacillus inners, those guys had the features of that bladder specific pain group, pain with bladder filling, relieved by bladder emptying. The ones that had that really difficult to treat phenotype have a lot of E. coli. Uh, and the ones that looked just like controls were our myofascial pain group. Um, and when we look at this, you know, using a bunch of, you know, trying to, to see is this statistically significant, we see that, you know, say for the bladder specific pain, there's a strong association of lactobacillus inners and with E. coli with, with bladder pain in general. And then if we look specifically for say each of these, and I'm just showing lactobacillus inners here, associated with specifically that pain with bladder filling, we see a good correlation. And then, um, so that's really cool. Um, and I'm really excited about this as a, as a potential sort of biomarker or screening methodology for these patients. But we decided it would be better if it didn't rely on, you know, next generation sequencing and relative abundances, just being that those are much more variable and harder to establish threshold value. So we decided to try to, to transition this to a PCR based out, out a readout. And what we found is that we could, in fact, sort of create thresholds and the purple is very hard to see from the blue here. So I apologize, that's my bad choice in colors, but um, that in the, this, this, there's that you could establish a threshold for lactobacillus inners by quantitative PCR that could distinguish this group of patients with bladder specific pain from the ones with more non-urologic pain and from the myofascial group and as well as controls. And then we could uh, do the same thing with E. coli, that there was a sort of threshold that was pretty good at distinguishing this doesn't respond to treatment group and is miserable uh, from everybody else. And so we're sort of in the process, we've been in the process of testing this in a much larger population. We have about 600 people that we're testing at the moment and the results are preliminary. So I don't really wanna show them just yet until we know that they're good, but they seem they seem promising in this larger population. And then to just kind of bring it back, I think what we what we sort of learned was that some of the stuff that we have relied upon in microbial analyses, you know, looking at diversity measures, at uh, principal component analysis, it can be a little deceptive when the differences are at a species or strain level, and we're definitely seeing in 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 some of our research that 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 is be, that is sort of bearing out in the data. Um, some people might have heard me talk about urino urologic fungi before, and we're definitely finding that there are very specific strain level values. You know, there are numerous other investigators, some of whom are on this call, who are looking at strain differences in, especially in neuropathogenic bacteria in, in, in UTI. And I think that that is the recognition that, that I've come away with from looking at this is that, you know, it isn't, it doesn't seem like it, it, it is just, just species. There's actually some very significant strain variations um, within the lactobacilli that may be driving a lot of this process and that, and that the, the, the trend may need to be to start looking at a, a, a really a metagenomic level and really considering some of those strain level differences if we're going to make progress trying to understand some of the pathophysiology in these conditions. Because um, here you've got these two groups, they're they're tremendously different, and yet in a principal component analysis it, at the genus level, you're going to see that they overlap completely. 
So when, just as some food for thought, you know, we are really interested in why lactobacillus inners is, is playing a role here. And, you know, we're currently doing a lot of mechanistic stuff in the lab. So again, don't have that to show you today, maybe another, another one. I, I think this group, I don't have to convince that all lactobacilli are the same, um, which is wonderful. But, you know, when we think about lactobacillus inners, it is a fundamentally very different kind of lactobacillus from the rest of, of the, the genus. Um, and, and what we're kind of interested in now is whether, whether inners is a byproduct of what these patients have been through prior to them presenting, meaning they often get a lot of antibiotics and it's documented at least in certain clinical scenarios that inners tends to be enriched in patients who've gotten repeated antibiotics or whether it's actually a part of the process. Um, it does make a specific bacterial lysin toxin that can break down epithelial barriers and could be responsible for some of those things. And so that's kind of our, our future directions in how to move forward. And then one last just piece of, I think, the thing that's interesting to me is just that when we look at um, urinary inflammatory profiles, because that's often been, you know, in the, in the literature for 20 years, people have been looking at urine inflammatory patterns. And basically, everybody's study looks different, and nobody can reproduce anybody else's study. So again, until somebody else could reproduce this from, from, from in our hand, from, from what we see, I'm not going to make anything of it. But I think what we did observe that was kind of interesting is that if we look at our, our bladder pain patients, compared, com and compare the, them to each other in terms of their their inflammatory profiles in the urinary tract it's really only that e coli group that comes out with significantly elevated urinary inflammatory markers and they're exactly what you'd expect with e coli around their il6 il8 il1 beta um, that sort of thing um, and the other ones really don't demonstrate a lot of urinary tract inflammation what's interesting to me is that that inners group actually does have some other types of systemic inflammation often with molecules that are involved in, or chemokines particularly, they're involved in mast cell regulation and recruitment. And so just kind of food for thought as we move forward into the next sort of realm of research, just given the implication of mast cells in bladder specific pain. Um, so just in conclusion, I'll, I'll sum it up so we can have a little bit of time for questions. Um, you know, when, when we, our microbial profiling did identify associations of two novel bacterial, what I'd like to call community states, with, with um, both a premenopausal state and genital urinary pain, and those types of pain were different. One was a bladder specific pain associated with lactobacillus centers. The other was a non sort of urologic associated pelvic pain that occurred with E. coli and that these community states correlate with distinct cytokine expression profiles, so seem to reflect a different kind of disease process in the two situations. And then we think the myofascial group is really not at all, it really truly from the bladder and the, and, the, and the urinary tract, it's really a pelvic process that's unrelated to microbial changes. And so um, that's, yeah, I guess that's, that's about it. We're going to be keeping working on a lot of our um, attempts to make this into a biomarker that could be used diagnostically and then working a lot of mechanistically in, in how these microbial changes may drive uh, bladder pathology. And I think I'll sum it up there with great thanks to the many, many people who have helped me uh, in this work and, and participated and, and take a second to ask if anybody has any questions they want me to answer. Thank you so much for having me today. I really appreciate the chance to, to meet with you and have really appreciated this seminar and um, learning from all of you, um, both here in the seminar as well as in your research works. I also want to put out two, out two other thank yous before I start, and that is to Dr. Emily Coffey, who introduced me to this caribou group. Um, Dr. Coffey does some really beautiful work in dogs and kidney stones in the neurobiome, and she'd be a great speaker if there's some um, remaining openings for speaking slots. Uh, I also want to put out a thank you to Zach Lewis, who is my graduate student, and I'll be featuring much of his work here, and it's been such a pleasure to work with him. He is just a fantastic scientist, and I'm excited to share his work with you today. I'm going to give you a little bit of background on my lab before we go into some of the work that we've been doing. So my primary focus is on the microbiome, which includes both gut and urine microbiome, um, in the realm of how environmental compounds um, affect both host and microbiome. And so I look work in translational animal models. So these are dogs or pet dogs that come into our College of Veterinary Medicine. 
And specifically, one of my interest areas is to understand how hosts and microbes um, deal with the external chemicals to which we are exposed. So one of the primary areas of my focus right now is looking at bladder cancer. So bladder cancer in dogs and humans is very similar. And bladder cancer is an um, environmental exposure risk disease. So in humans, that's dominated by um, exposure to tobacco smoke and other occupational hazards. In dogs, it can be due to secondhand smoke or to herbicides and pesticides that might they might be exposed to when they're walking across lawns. And so I really want to understand how does the environment influence disease through the microbiome. And so ultimately, like so many of you, I have these, you know, very ambitious disease questions, but um, there's some basic questions that we as a lab had to answer first for ourselves about the urinary tract and the dog urinary tract and the urobiome. And so one was, how do we study this urobiome? And are dogs even a good model for the microbiome? So this is some of the background work that we've done, and I'm just making you um, aware of this. So we've looked at urine extraction methods, um, at much like uh, the Karsten's work, and we found in our hands, chiogen bacteremia was really effective for our dog urine um, for getting the greatest total and bacterial DNA concentrations um, and extracting bacteria from the greatest number of urine samples. We've also done some longitudinal work, and so this was longitudinal samples um, that looked at the difference between our weeks and months um, in the urine uh, environment. So we looked at pH, specific gravity, protein profiles, cultures, and we also have in preparation urobiome over all of those time points. And the, the really fascinating thing is the urobiome, and, and this is midstream free catch urine, um, was relatively consistent uh, in most dogs. And some dogs varied a lot more. Other dogs were just um, spot on consistent the entire time over three months. So um, this has been fun for us to start exploring. So if we ask, are dogs a good model for the human microbiome? Those of you who have dogs may have some thoughts on why dogs might be a good model for the human microbiome. So getting into some of the questions around this is, do humans and dogs share bacteria? And the answer is yes. There was a um, study done earlier on uh, humans who live in households with dogs. And it found that people in households with dogs shared more similar gut and skin bacterial taxa than between um, households without dogs. So these dogs are acting as little vectors sharing bacteria in your household. Um, and what we wanted to ask was, are they actually sharing this bacteria at a strain level? So if you have an E. coli and your dog has an E. coli, are you really sharing? And so we took, um, this is Morgan Evans, a former postdoc who took some publicly available data. And this is um, from an article coming out of Gautam Dantas's lab in Peru, where he looked at several different households and he looked at the gut microbiome and the people and the animals. So this included dogs, cows, chickens, as well as the water, the street runoff and the wastewater in the several households and looked, um, he was looking for antimicrobial resistance genes. We took the exact same shotgun metagenomics data and said, okay, what strains of bacteria are shared between humans and animals? And this is an example of what we found. And I'm only sharing the dog data here, but we also had, saw this in cows and chickens. So these are three individuals in household three this is an individual in household eight, and this is a dog that was associated with household four. And what's kind of cool here is every color line you see here, that is a strain at 99.9% .9 average nucleotide identity that is being shared between these individuals. And you can really clearly see that this man and this dog share a lot of strains, and these are not necessarily pathogens at all. These are just um, commensals. Uh, and so this kind of makes this fascinating, compelling story that this dog and this man must be hanging out a lot um, to share all of these strains. So the answer is yes, humans and dogs absolutely share gut bacterial strains that are non-pathogens and share them at a strain level. Well, you know, what about rodent models? They're really excellent and um, help us do a lot of research. How does a dog model compare to a rodent model for microbiome research? Well, here you've got human gut samples from the um, Human Microbiome Project, all in blue. You have um, pig samples here in orange. You have dog samples here in pink 
and you have rodent samples here in green. And what you're seeing is that these dog samples are actually much more similar in terms of microbial composition to the human samples than the rodent samples are. So dogs do make a really compelling model for gut microbiomes um, looking at humans in comparison to humans. And if we actually look at the genes, so the microbial genes um, here, we're looking at what genes map to a human microbial gene catalog. And so humans to themselves are at you know, the most highest percent but the next most similar gene catalog is coming from dogs and then pigs and then mice. So it's not just similarity in um, species, but also similarity in genes that are being uh, present in dogs. So now, of course, our um, key interest in this group is what about urine? Do humans and dogs share urinary tract associated bacteria? And this is a study that was done on a household repeatedly over time, so studied in 2005, 2007, and 2008. And so it's a mother, a father, and three kids, two daughters, a son, and a dog. And here, what you're looking at in the colored bars are E. coli clones. And here in the red circles, these are episodes of urinary tract infections. And so what you're seeing here in um, the mom is the mom had a urinary tract infection with this clone A that was present in her urine, and also in her feces. But that clone was also found in the father, found in the daughter, and found in the dog's feces. And then in 2007, the dog had a urinary tract infection. And you can see that that E. coli clone was found in that dog's feces, but also present in the feces of the daughter and son. And so this is kind of a um, interesting thought that you know there's this other factor within households where urinary tract uh, pathogens could be shared between both human individuals as well as dogs or serving as, you know, an, an existing place where these um, microbes can be found. So yes, humans and dogs share urinary tract infection associated E. coli clones. Well, how does the dog model compare to a rodent model for urobiome research? And this is where we start getting into Zach's work, but let me rephrase this question for you. How much urine can you get from a mouse? Now, what I really want this answer to be is that we can do urobiome research from a single mouse and do lots of cool experiments um, in a mouse model. But for us to be able to see if that was even a possibility, what we did was we took urine from five healthy dogs and then we fractionated it into different volumes. And this is actually quite similar to um, Lisa Karsten's article who did this with a zymopositive control. But here we're using actual urine and all of these urines are, um, many of these low volumes were actually undetectable on a qubit um, in terms of DNA concentration. So we are looking at these different um, volumes of urine as opposed to me saying concentrations of urine. And this is again, getting at a lot of the questions that we're trying to answer about how do we study the urobiome. So ultimately, and I'll show you a little bit of this data, what we found is samples that were greater than one milliliter were optimal for consistent representative urine microbial community profiles. And this was by 16S rRNA sequencing. So very similar to, um, the, uh, to Lisa's work, what we found is as the urine sample volume increased or essentially what should be um, equivalent to concentration, we see a lower abundance of contaminant sequences. And these um, samples with very low sample volumes had much higher abundances of contaminant sequences. Now, this was interesting because this is opposite of um, what Lisa found. And that is, as we increased urine sample volume, we saw an increase in microbial diversity that we were able to observe in these samples. And we think that this was true urine microbial diversity that we are more effective at detecting in these larger volume samples. Um, and so for us, these three and five mil urine samples demonstrated lower contaminant abundance and greater microbial diversity. Now, you know, it, it's these human urobiome studies have ranged from 0.5 mils to using 50 mils of urine. And so if you've got 50 mils of urine, by all means, use it. What we're trying to do is understand, you know, is there some threshold volume uh, below which we shouldn't go in order to get really reproducible results? 
And so this is another way to look at it. This is just um, one dog, but I'm showing you this as an example of what we saw in many of the dogs. These three samples here, this is the one mil, three mil, and five mil sample. And you can see um, here, you've got the 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and 0.5 mil samples. And so you've got a whole lot bigger difference in microbial community composition in those very low volume samples as compared to the kind of consistency that you're seeing once that sample volume increases. And so, of course, what we suspect is happening here is that we're losing these rare microbes in the low volume samples, um, and we're able to maintain um, them more consistently in higher volume samples. Um, so this helped shape our work using at least three mils. Um, and this is also useful because often when you get a sample, you wanna do some metabolomics, you wanna do some 16S, you wanna do some metagenomics. And so you may have a limited volume that you can work with. Um, so we then used this information to help shape our study on bladder cancer urobiome and gut microbiome. And what we found was that your, ooh, um, urine but not fecal microbial composition and diversity differed in dogs with bladder cancer. Um, we also observed that microbial taxonomic and functional diversity was decreased in the urine of dogs with bladder cancer. And I'm not gonna dive deeply into this study, but what I think is relevant to this group, um, particularly in light of the, the conversation we just had with Dr. Ackerman is one of the things we saw is that fusobacterium was observed in the urine of dogs with urothelial carcinoma, but not in healthy dogs. It was also increased in the dogs, uh, samples of dogs with urothelial carcinoma, not significantly, but we did see a slight increase. Um, we also saw shared um, ASVs. So again, with our 16S data, um, shared taxa, th this fusobacterium species between urine and feces in dogs with urothelial carcinoma which really um, makes me think a lot more about how much do we need to be thinking about the sharing between urine and feces here or urine and gut. Um, the other piece that we found that was super interesting to me is that the taxa with the greatest abundance of functional pathways associated with bladder cancer samples was an Enterococcus fecalis. Now, both healthy dogs and dogs with bladder cancer contained Enterococcus fecalis within our metagenomic data. However, the dogs with bladder cancer, the Enterococcus fecalis genomes in those dogs had the ability or had genes that um, were able to degrade polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and dogs that were healthy did not have those pathways. Now that's really important because PAHs or polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are one of those exposures that are, that are associated with bladder cancer. And so if you're a microbe in a bladder and you're doing this metabolism, that's really important for us to know about and think about as we think about bladder cancer as a disease process. Um, and it's not something that we spent time thinking about before. So again, this is getting at, to the point that strain could be really important here. Um, and so, you know, we we put out this first set of work and said, hey, we've got these dogs. These dogs have bladder cancer. We are looking at their urobiome. We think they're a great model for humans because um, we know that dogs are a good model for bladder cancer. Well, reviewer two said, but are dogs really a good model for the human urobiome? Now, in a perfect world, what we would do is we would get urine from the individuals in the same household as the dogs. We would extract them all in the same batch. We would use the same extraction kit. And um, that would be a really wonderful way to see if, in fact, dogs and humans have very similar urobiomes. But what happened in reality is we don't have those samples from humans. So instead, we went to publicly available data on studies that have looked at the urobiome in individuals with and without bladder cancer. And what we found was we were, made us pretty nervous. So we've got samples from all over the world. They are um, they could be different collection methods. They could be um, a slightly different manner of sequencing or sequencing platforms. They could be different extraction kits. And we thought, wow, um, we're going to look at this data, and it's going to be you know dogs over here and humans over here, and it's going to be so far apart. And it's not going to be because dogs aren't a good model. It's going to be because these data are just there's no way they could possibly line up. And what shocked us is that was not what we saw. And so we we did this initially just with one human study in our dog data set. And now Zach Lewis has expanded that into some additional human studies and additional dog data sets to see what we could see. And this is what we saw. 
this is um, over a thousand healthy human urobiomes. And when we add dog urobiomes into that, here you can see they're sitting right here intermixed with those human urobiomes. Um, when we add human bladder cancer urobiomes into that, you see this trailing tail, particularly um, off to the left here. And when we add canine bladder cancer urobiomes into that, we see the same trailing tail over here, um, which is super fascinating. And we've kind of gone back and um, thought about this data over and over again to see, you know, what is driving this, this tail as well as, wow, look, the dogs are sitting right with the humans. They are actually an even better model than we thought they would be for the human neurobiome. So in that tail, incidentally, we're seeing increased from acuities taxa, um, it associated with urothelial carcinoma, but that's at such a high level, we need to dig into this much further uh, before we can understand if there's something there that is a driver. Uh, so this gave us really wonderful, exciting evidence that dogs are, are, are a strong model for the human urobiome. And our takeaways from this bladder cancer study um, are that the taxes shared between the urine and the gut may be important for us to, to look at um, what might be there and what might be playing a role in disease processes. Uh, that microbial strain differences may also be key to elucidating disease biology, as has already been noted earlier today. The other part of that is we saw when we were doing shotgun metagenomics in healthy urine, we had about 4% host reads, but in urine from in, um, dogs with bladder cancer, we had over 75% of host reads in there. These dogs, they're shedding a lot more cells um, from their bladders that have these tumors in them. And that really hurts our ability to get urobiome data out of uh, these samples. And so um, another thing that Zach has been working on is looking at different host cell removal methods. And so we did this in seven dogs. We um, put, took the same set of urine and we, the, um, these are healthy dogs now. So we spiked some additional host cells in because normal urine is pretty um, low in host cells. So we spiked additional dog cells in at a biologically relevant level. And we looked at several different kits. Now, four of these kits have a host cell removal step. Bacteremia does not have a host cell removal step. And here, what you're seeing is the percent host reads on the y-axis. So you can see in these spiked samples, even though they've gone through this host removal kit, you can see a lot of these, you're still seeing 60 to 90% host reads in there, but you do have some kits that are sticking out as more effective for removing host cells. Um, and when we look at microbial reads, you're seeing those same kits where you're able to obtain more microbial reads uh, from the samples where you have more host cells removed. Now, what's really important to us here is to also understand if these methods are biasing the microbial community. And so we're currently in the process of analyzing these data. Um, the other part of this is that we were able to generate eight metagenome assembled genomes from um, these shotgun data, which is not very much from urine, but um, certainly something that um, could be helpful for us trying to understand unculturable or yet to be cultured bacteria from the urine microbiome. Um, and so conceptually, of course, what we were trying to do is determine if we could remove these host cells, so here in pink, um, without biasing the community. So we, we already are seeing within our data that some of these um, extraction methods are biasing the community. Um, some of them seem to be biasing the community less, but we, we will report back with more information on that. Um, and so our final takeaways here are dogs are a robust model for the urobiome and that these translational approaches across species are really powerful for studying disease uh, biology. And finally, that continued optimization of host cell removal and urine shotgun metagenomic sequencing approaches will improve our ability to characterize the functional potential of urine microbial communities and challenging to culture microbes.